Good evening, it's Tuesday, August 27th. I'm Max Pringle with Scott Baba. Coming up, the special counsel in Donald Trump's classified documents case has re-indicted the former president on charges of mishandling classified documents after a Trump-appointed federal judge in Florida ruled the original charges unconstitutional. Vice President Harris agrees to a televised sit-down interview this week on CNN It will be her first since taking over the top of the Democratic ticket following President Biden's decision to bow out of the race for a second term. Much of the middle of the country is sweltering under a blistering late summer heat wave, but there's relief in sight later this week, forecasters say. The United Nations presents a dire report on the uh, the warming of the climate, and calls for global leaders to take immediate action to avert disaster. And California's schools chief endorses state legislation to restrict smartphone use in the state's public schools. Proponents of limiting phones on campus say it will increase student engagement and boost mental health. These stories and more coming up from the studios of KPFA in Berkeley. This is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Max Pringle with Scott Bobble. Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign has a new advertising push to draw attention to her plan to build 3 million new homes over four years. It's a move designed to contain inflationary pressures that also draws a sharp contrast to Republican Donald Trump's approach. Meanwhile, Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, campaigns today in Big Rapids, Michigan. More from Jennifer King. A new campaign ad titled Every Day gives a glimpse of how the Harris Walls campaign intends to wrestle with the specter of inflation and housing affordability, top issues with voters. Prices are still too high. Harris says she also wants to go after corporate price gouging and expand the child tax credit. The ad is part of a blitz targeting battleground states and features clips from the vice president's speech in North Carolina, where she unveiled a series of proposals like building three million new homes and having the government provide assistance to first-time homebuyers. Former President Donald Trump has said Harris can't pay for her housing agenda and suggests cracking down on illegal immigration would somehow help. Later today, Harris will deliver a video message to a conference of African Methodist Episcopal churches. Senator J.D. Vance, the Republican vice presidential nominee, speaks today on the economy at a picturesque horse farm in Big Rapids, Michigan. Prices are up. At Vance's recent appearance in Asheboro, North Carolina, he went after the administration's record. It is impossible for young Americans to find an affordable home to raise their families in. Jennifer King, Washington. Special Counsel Jack Smith has filed a new indictment against former President Trump. Sagar Magani reports. Special Counsel Jack Smith has filed a new indictment against Donald Trump over his bid to undo the 2020 presidential election. The indictment keeps the same criminal charges against Trump, but narrows the allegations against him, removing references to Trump's interactions with the Justice Department. The Supreme Court said last month that Trump is entitled to immunity for that conduct. Still, the indictment keeps the allegations that Trump tried to pressure then-Vice President Mike Pence to refuse to certify the electoral vote count. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote last month the interactions between the two men amounted to official conduct, for which Trump is at least presumptively immune from prosecution. Sagar Magani, Washington. The Biden administration is offering federal resources to former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris for presidential transitional planning for the first time. But experts suggest that both teams are already behind in preparing for their potential administrations. Both Harris and Trump started the process just this month, which is months later than prior transitions. Today is the latest congressionally mandated date for the General Services Administration to make space available for Trump and Harris, coming three business days after the second nominating convention. Vice President Kamala Harris is sitting down with CNN this week for her first interview since President Biden dropped his re-election bid. 
She'll be joined by her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walls, in a joint interview with CNN anchor Dana Bash in Savannah, Georgia. Harris has been criticized by conservatives for not holding news conferences or granting interviews with news outlets since Biden stepped aside on July 21st. Trump's campaign has kept a tally of the days that she's gone that have gone by as, as a candidate without giving an interview. Earlier this month, Harris told reporters that she wanted to do her first formal interview before the end of August. The interview will air at 6 p.m. Pacific on Thursday. Israeli military officials say more than one million doses of polio vaccine have been delivered to Gaza after the first confirmed case of the disease in the territory in a quarter century. It is not immediately clear how the vaccine will be distributed in the enclave amid ongoing fighting and a chaotic security situation. Jody Jacobs reports. Amidst ongoing fighting and the United Nations alert on Monday that the security situation in Gaza has deteriorated drastically, millions of life-saving polio vaccines have arrived in the Strip. More than 640,000 children must be vaccinated, according to UNICEF, and it plans to roll out this vaccination drive by as early as this weekend. The WHO and UNICEF say a seven-day pause in the fighting is needed to carry out this campaign. However, it seems the organizations will try, despite the challenging circumstances, to forge ahead. Jody Jacobs, New York. The Midwest is broiling under an intense heat wave, with temperatures approaching triple digits and high humidity. The heat wave is expected to last a few more days. Julie Walker reports. The heat persists across the middle part of the country, but forecasters say by the end of the month, cooler air comes in. At the Minnesota State Fair Monday, visitors like Mikosa Taylor were trying to beat the soaring temperatures. As long as people stay hydrated, I think we're going to be okay. National Weather Service meteorologist Josh Weiss says parts of Illinois and Ohio will approach 100 degrees. With uh, heat indices that may be exceeding 110 degrees in some places as far south as as the uh, Tennessee Valley and towards the Gulf Coast. So very hot temperatures today. But that does start to shift eastward over the next few days. He says this week the heat shifts eastward and some areas of the country could see problematic rain. I'm Julie Walker. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg says senior Biden administration officials pressured Facebook to, quote, censor some COVID-19 content during the pandemic, saying it was helping spread misinformation. Sagar Magani reports. In a letter to the House Judiciary Committee's GOP chair, Zuckerberg says officials repeatedly pressured Facebook to take down some virus content and were frustrated when the company did not agree. The administration did speak out in 2021 about what President Biden called virus misinformation on Facebook. It's killing people. But spokeswoman Jen Psaki stressed the fight was against the virus itself, not social media. We're not in a war or a battle with Facebook. Zuckerberg says the pressure was wrong and Facebook made choices it would not make today without elaborating. He says the platform will push back if it happens again. Sagar Magani, Washington. Italian prosecutors are investigating the captain of a super yacht that sank during a storm off Sicily last week, killing seven people. Lawyer Aldo Mordiglia said James Cutfeld a New Zealand national is being investigated for possible manslaughter and culpable shipwreck. Mordelia said Cutfield will be questioned again by prosecutors today without adding details on his defensive strategy. Under Italian law, being under investigation doesn't imply being guilty and doesn't necessarily lead to criminal charges. Cutfield was among 15 survivors of the August 19th sinking that killed British tech magnate Mike Lynch, his daughter Hannah, and five others. Africa's public health body says it is seeing a rapid increase in impox cases, with almost 4,000 reported on the continent in the last week. The Africa CDC is also repeating a plea for long-awaited vaccines whose arrival this week in Congo the most affected country, had been delayed. The first batch of vaccine doses promised to Africa will arrive on September 1st after delays caused by documentation and emergency authorization issues. 
that will include 50,000 doses promised by the United States government and 15,000 from Vaccines Alliance, GAVI. Congo is the epicenter of the global health emergency, with a new variant detected there. For more on the difficulties getting Mpox vaccine where it's needed, we turn to an interview on KPFA's Upfront program today. Host Brian edwards Teekert spoke with Public Citizen's Access to Medicine Director, Peter May Barduck. Janaeus is a vaccine with a history that dates back to public funding in Bavaria uh, in the 1950s and over time was purposed against smallpox. And as you, you say, now we know uh, effective against mpox. There was a, a very significant 2022 uh, outbreak and scare and uh, Janaeus was stockpiled by the, the West and, and wealthy countries and, and, uh, and rolled out to stem that outbreak here. But supplies really did not reach Africa. The uh, vaccine is controlled by uh, one, con- uh, one company, Bavarian Nordic. Uh, and as you say, is charging about $100 for the vaccine to the best of our Uh, information, which uh, is an awful lot of money because based on our research, vaccines that use similar production processes uh, have been sold by Global South manufacturers for as little as $4. Now, we don't know Bavarian Nordic's production costs here uh, exactly because they're uh, not revealing them. We don't know their planned pricing for different providers because they're not revealing them. But we do know that Uh, prices on that order have very seriously held up the public response, public health response to many previous crises. And it's it's of course very difficult for most African nations to spend $100 a person uh, or even a substantial discount off that uh, amount to protect public health. So instead we have uh, a response to a burgeoning crisis that must be fueled by uh, charitable donations essentially from the uh, from the global health community. And it's always just harder and takes more time uh, to roll out a response under those circumstances. So, you know, as you say, price is just one factor in this crisis, but we, we think it's an important one and we think it's one for which there's absolutely no excuse. The vaccine could be affordable and uh, you know, control over, over the patent and the technology by one company is holding up the more democratic rollout of that technology. So if this is a vaccine that's existed for more than half a century, like explain what, what exactly, where exactly their pricing power comes from. Is this a, a patent monopoly for Bavarian Nordic or they're just the only company that's worked out the details of how to manufacture the vaccine effectively? It's both. You know, with vaccines, you have both the patent problem and you have the recipe or you, ha- you have... Uh, technological processes that the companies maintain as trade secrets. And those can be reverse engineered with time. Uh, Scientists have been able to work this out uh, in other areas, but it does take time. And uh, it's better, of course, to just have the available processes shared. And there can be cost sharing arrangements for that. You know, the world can pay in, countries can pay in, companies that use the technology can pay in and provide uh, royalties, for example, that the companies that did the original research but you don't want a monopoly on the vaccine driving up prices and slowing down production. And the problem in 2022 was you had a, a, not only a concentrated company production, but a concentrated production site and a long delay that meant that there weren't going to be uh, vaccines available as, as broadly as needed and, and sort of push some of the hoarding and stockpiling in, in the West that we saw at the time. What about the pharmaceutical sector's argument that without the promise of uh, windfall monopoly profits, they are not going to spend a ton of money on research and development for drugs and vaccines that may ultimately be dead ends? Well, prices aren't related to research and development costs. Uh, they're, they are simply the most that companies, they're, they're the most that collectively we're willing to pay for a needed medical intervention under monopoly circumstances. So. Um, there, we could have a more efficient uh, pricing system, but it's it's got nothing to do with the system that we have today. We can all pay in, uh, and most of these vaccines and treatments, like here in the United States, a successful vaccine or, or treatment is going to be wildly profitable, uh, even with 
significant changes uh, to the to the pricing structures. And that's Public Citizen's Access to Medicine Director Peter Maybarduk speaking with Upfront host Brian Edwards Teekert. Upfront airs Monday through Friday at 7 on KPFA. President Biden spoke Monday with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The call comes days after Modi visited Kyiv, Ukraine. Modi has not formally condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Modi said in a posting on X that he spoke to Biden about what he said was India's full support for an early return of peace and stability in Ukraine. Modi said he and Biden also discussed India's concern about the safety of Hindus and other religious minorities in neighboring Bangladesh after this month's ouster of the country's long-serving prime minister, Sheikh Hasina. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is visiting Beijing in a bid to manage strained relations between the U.S. and China. More from Donna Warder. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has arrived in China for three days of talks in hopes of maintaining communication in a relationship that has broken down during the Biden administration. Ahead of the trip, Sullivan said that likely to be discussed with his Chinese counterparts is overcapacity. Massive subsidies going into the Chinese electric vehicle industry uh, have eliminated a level playing field. And so part of the economic response the U.S. has taken is responding to that. The Biden administration has taken a tough line on China, restricting the access of its companies to advanced technology and confronting China as it tries to exert influence over Taiwan and the South China Sea. I'm Donna Water. President Biden's top Middle East advisor held talks today in Doha, with senior Qatari leaders on the ongoing efforts to complete a ceasefire and hostage deal between Israel and Hamas. Meanwhile, Qatar's prime minister is holding meetings this week with Iran's president. That's according to a U.S. official who wasn't authorized to comment publicly on the matter. White House senior advisor Brett McGurk's talks with Prime Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Thani and the Qatari foreign affairs minister come after the prime minister's Monday visit to Tehran to meet with Iran's president, Masoud Pozeshkian. Working-level negotiations on a Gaza ceasefire deal are expected to resume in Doha on Wednesday. The Taliban is rejecting United Nations concerns and criticism over new so-called vice and virtue laws that include a ban on women's voices and bare faces in public. On Sunday, the head of the UN mission in Afghanistan said the law showed a, quote, distressing vision for the country's future. Rosa Untumbayeva said the laws extended what she called the already intolerable restrictions on the rights of women and girls, with even the sound of a female voice outside the home apparently deemed a moral violation. Taliban spokesperson Zabihula Mujahid warned on Monday against what he called arrogance from those who he said may not be familiar with Islamic law, particularly non-Muslims who might raise objections. A separatist group linked to the Pakistani Taliban has claimed responsibility for the deadliest day in recent history in Pakistan's Balochistan and warned of more attacks to come. Charles Diladesma reports. Pakistan's Prime Minister has declared that there will be no peace talks with the Balochistan Liberation Army insurgents, who also have targeted Chinese-funded projects there. The attacks indicate that the BLA, which has targeted security forces for years in small-scale attacks and is allied with the Pakistani Taliban, is now much more organised. But the Interior Minister says there's no need for a large-scale operation against them. I'm Charles Diladesma. Israeli forces rescued a hostage found alone in Gaza, freeing a living captive from Hamas's vast tunnel network for the first time since the October 7th attack that ignited the war. Joseph Fetterman has more. The army isn't saying much about this operation. It only says that the 52-year-old man was found in a tunnel in southern Gaza in what it says was a very complicated operation. The man has been identified as Qaid Farhan al-Qadi, He is a member of Israel's Bedouin Arab minority and he was working as a security guard last October 7th when he was abducted with roughly 250 other people. 
His rescue has lifted spirits in a country that is wary after nearly 11 months of war. It also could put some pressure on Hamas during ongoing ceasefire talks. al qadi is the eighth hostage to be rescued by Israeli forces, but Israel says that over a hundred others remain in captivity. It estimates that at least a third of them have died, and it fears that that number could continue to rise. And that's Joseph Fetterman. U.S. officials are warning of a potential ecological disaster in the Red Sea following an attack by Yemen-based Iranian-backed Houthi rebels on an oil tanker last week. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas-Greenfield earlier this week called on the U.N. Security Council to condemn the Houthi attack on the MT Delta Sonian. In a statement on social media, Thomas Greenfield said, quote, The Houthis' brazen actions threatened to create an ecological disaster, with devastating consequences for the region. She said the U.N. Security Council should demand immediate compliance with a January resolution calling on the Houthis to immediately stop attacking ships in the Red Sea. Iran-backed Houthis said last week that they targeted the Greek-flagged tanker as part of their campaign against commercial shipping in the region in support of Palestinians during the Israel-Hamas war. The European Union's Red Sea naval mission, Aspides, said the burning tanker was carrying 150,000 metric tons of crude oil from Iraq. U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said that the Houthis, quote, have made clear they are willing to destroy the fishing industry and regional ecosystem that Yemenis, Yemenis and other communities in the region rely on for their livelihoods. He added that the group has undermined the delivery of vital humanitarian aid to the region through their attacks. Iran's supreme leader has opened the door to renewed negotiations with the U.S. over his country's rapidly advancing nuclear program. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei told its civilian government on Tuesday that there was no harm in engaging with what he calls the enemy. Khamenei's remarks set clear red lines for any talks taking place under the government of reformist President Masoud Bezeshkian. Khamenei renewed his warnings that Washington wasn't to be trusted, but his comments mirror those around the time of Iran's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers. The agreement saw Tehran's nuclear program greatly curtailed in exchange for the lifting of economic sanctions. Then-President Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew the U.S. from the deal in 2018. An international coalition of dozens of human rights groups today released a joint statement in support of the No Death Penalty Tuesdays hunger strikes taking place in Iranian prisons. The No Death Penalty Tuesdays campaign originated in Iran's Ghazal Hisar prison, after the execution of four Kurdish political prisoners in January of this year. Since then, it has spread to over 17 prisons across the country. The statement read in part, quote, We call for an immediate halt on all executions with a view to abolish the death penalty in Iran and urge the international community to support the growing abolition movement in Iran, unquote. The Center for Human Rights in Iran reported that the Islamic Republic has carried out over 395 executions so far in 2024. The joint statement accused Iranian authorities of, quote, using the death penalty as a tool of political repression. It also said death sentences are issued after unfair trials without the minimal standards of due process. The letter calls for an immediate halt to executions in Iran and urges the international community to stand in solidarity with prisoners participating in their weekly hunger strikes. NASA has decided it's too risky to bring two astronauts back to Earth in Boeing's troubled new capsule. They'll have to wait until February for a ride home with SpaceX. The pair were only supposed to be at the International Space Station for eight days. However, numerous technical issues emerged on the Boeing space capsule. Simon Marks has more. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. Today, the efforts underway to bring two American astronauts back to Earth from the International Space Station. They've been stranded there after arriving on the station on June the 6th for an anticipated eight-day mission. 
Now it's apparent they won't be able to return to Earth until next February due to problems with the Boeing Starliner craft that ferried them aloft in the first place. SpaceX will now bring them home instead. Dr. Ezzy Pearson is Features Editor with Sky at Night magazine. In June, the Boeing Starliner spacecraft carried two astronauts up to the International Space Station. During that flight, there were some problems with the propulsion systems. There were various hydrogen leaks and things like that. So they've remained on there for the last couple of months whilst they sort of troubleshoot the problem. And it's now got to the stage where NASA's just not confident that it can make it home safe. And when it comes to human lives, you have to be confident about that sort of thing. So that's why SpaceX has now sort of stepped in. Um, and the the next Dragon flight will have too few people on it to leave space for these two astronauts to come home. The Boeing craft has encountered issues with its thrusters. And while four of the spacecraft's five thrusters have now reactivated in orbit, Boeing and NASA agreed last week that they cannot predict with certainty how the craft will fare when it returns to Earth, now uncrewed next month. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. Some Muslim Americans who resigned from the Biden administration to protest the war in Gaza are calling on the Biden administration to freeze arms shipments to Israel and to force an end to what they call Gaza genocide. A former State Department diplomat and a former Interior Department official joined the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, to blast what they describe as Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian racism, that they say influences U.S. Mideast policy, including the war in Gaza. Christopher Martinez reports. Since the terrorist attacks in Israel 10 months ago and the following Israeli military action in Gaza, at least a dozen Biden administration officials have publicly resigned in protest of U.S. policy in the war. Some claim dozens more have resigned silently, deciding not to go public. Now, some Muslim American resignees are helping lead a call for a ceasefire and an end to U.S. arms shipments to Israel. Edward Ahmed Mitchell is National Deputy Director of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Those officials had various reasons for stepping down. Some, it was their conscience. They just could not be part of the administration while doing this. Some did not want to violate the law. Some wanted to be able to speak up publicly about what was happening. For some, it was all the above. Mitchell hosted an online news conference with two Muslim Americans who have resigned in protest and are now calling for action. They say anti-Muslim bigotry and anti-Palestinian racism are leading U.S. policy in the Mideast, and particularly in Gaza. Halal Rariet was a foreign service diplomat for 18 years, most recently serving as Arab language spokesperson for the State Department at a media hub in the U.S. consulate in Dubai. It has become, are you with us or against us? That's not how a democratic administration is supposed to function. She was the first U.S. diplomat to resign in protest of U.S. Gaza policy, calling it a failed, inhuman, militaristic strategy. There was no particular tipping point, honestly. It was a devastating day-to-day -day continuation of the same failed policy uh, that eventually left me absolutely helpless and hopeless. And that is the very first time in my 18-year diplomatic career that I have ever felt that. She says U.S. policy was devastating for Palestinians and was leading to increasing anti-American sentiments in the Middle East, and she began to feel complicit in the policy. She described being a spokesperson, a face for the policy in the Arab world. But when I read the talking points, I, I would literally say, are you kidding me? Did somebody actually write this and expects me to say this in front of Arab media? There is no way, because there was an inherent dehumanization of Palestinians in the language, right? They're, for one, at the very beginning of the conflict, they weren't even mentioned in our talking points. Also joining the call was Mariam Hassanein, formerly a special assistant in the Department of the Interior. She calls Biden's policy genocide enabling and dehumanizing toward Arabs and Muslims. She was the first Muslim appointee to the Biden administration to resign in protest, and the youngest to resign so far. She says the moment she decided to resign came after seeing protests by students, and when she saw a crackdown on students at Columbia University, she decided she did not want to be associated with Israeli atrocities. I recognize that if these students who uh, you know, have a lot to, to lose 
uh, can put things on the line and and advocate, then I too, as someone who you know who's in the workforce, who especially is in public service and, and in the administration, um, should also advocate and and should also you know reject uh, being associated, having my labor associated um, with the genocide in any way. Hassanin and Rari are not the only people to resign from the Biden administration in protest of Gaza policies. Ana Castillo, in the White House Office of Management and Budget, became the first known White House official to resign in protest back in April. Lily Greenberg Call, in the Interior Department, became the first Jewish appointee to resign in protest in May, saying the administration has weaponized her community as a shield to dodge accountability for atrocities. Some say as many as two dozen others have resigned quietly without making their reasons public. As for Hassanein and Hararit, they're joining a call for the Biden administration to freeze weapons shipments to Israel. They're asking people to contact the Biden administration to tell it to follow the law. Edward Ahmed Mitchell of CARE says it's time for the Biden administration to listen to voices of conscience and stop the genocide. We hope that shedding a light on these problems on this bigotry will eventually lead to a change in policy so that we never have to have a conversation like this again. We never have to sit here and speak to government officials to ask why they had to resign in protest of a genocide. Let this be the last time we ever have to do this, God willing. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Ukrainian military officials said today that Russia has fired dozens of missiles and drones across Ukraine for a second day. Ukraine's president said some were shot down by Western-supplied F-16 fighter jets before they reached their targets. Charles Deledesma reports. Ukraine's president says nighttime Russian drone and missile attacks have left at least four people dead a day after a heavy barrage pounded the country's energy facilities. <laughs> Rescue workers pull a person out of debris in Krivirea. The Ukrainian state emergency service says a rocket hit a hotel around midnight, partially destroying the four-story building in the city in central Ukraine. In the Kyiv region, which has struggled with blackouts after Monday's onslaught, five air alerts were called during the night. The regional administration said air defences destroyed all the drones and missiles, but that falling debris had set off forest fires. Zelensky says the attacks included over 80 drones, and that, as well as the deaths, at least 16 people were injured. I'm Charles de la Tesma. The United Nations top weather agency issued a stark warning this week about how climate change is especially endangering the lives and livelihoods of those living in the island nations of the South Pacific. The UN World Meteorologic- Meteorological Organization released its annual report on the state of the climate in the Southwest Pacific Ocean, this one covering 2023. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaking today with WMO Secretary General Celeste Saulo at the Pacific Islands Forum in Tonga called the report's findings dire. I am in Tonga to issue a global SOS, Save Our Seas, on rising sea levels. Global average sea levels are rising at rates unprecedented in the past 3,000 years. Relative sea levels in the southwestern Pacific have risen even more than the global average. Greenhouse gases, overwhelmingly generated by burning fossil fuels, are cooking our planet. And the sea is taking the hit, literally. Rising seas are a crisis entirely of humanity's making. A crisis that will soon swell to an almost unimaginable scale. But if we save the Pacific, we also save ourselves. According to the WMO, the Pacific Islands are uniquely exposed to the effects of climate change. This despite accounting for just 0.02% of global carbon emissions. Their average elevation is just 1 to 2 meters above sea level. 90% of the populations live within 5 kilometers of the coast and half the infrastructure is within 500 meters of the sea. WMO WMO spokesperson Claire Nollis said the report highlights that the region is disproportionately impacted by the rising oceans, as well as by other climate change effects like ocean acidification and marine heat waves. This shows that indeed sea level rise in the region is above the global average. It's not uniform. It does vary within the southwest uh, Pacific. Sea surface temperatures have risen three times faster than the global average since 1980. And during that time, marine heat waves have approximately doubled in frequency and they are more intense and lasting longer. 
Nolis said that there was some good news in the report in the form of human intervention and technological developments, such as the inauguration of a new weather radar station at the airport in Tonga. And this means that it's a big boost both for weather forecasts, um, for early warnings, um, which is you know one of our top priorities, as both Celeste Saulo and Mr. Guterres underlined in, in Tonga. You know, we need to get the early warnings out and we need to um, make sure that people can act on them. Next month, the United Nations General Assembly is scheduled to hold a special session to discuss rising seas. Proposed legislation could soon ban students from using phones and social media in California schools. More from Emily Burris. Students and state lawmakers joined a hearing held by California's Closing the Digital Divide Task Force, which convened to discuss legal actions being proposed to limit students' use of phones and social media in schools. Existing legislation in California already allows school districts to regulate the use of smartphones on school grounds, but Senate Bill 1283 would explicitly allow districts to limit or prohibit social media use at schools. The bill was authored by Democratic Senator Henry Stern of Calabasas, who said this bill would give school districts an option rather than a requirement to limit or prohibit social media use, noting the prevalence of cyberbullying. In our social media restrictions, what we're anticipating is also that schools um, restrict access to certain apps potentially during the day um, and see what students come up with beyond that. Students spoke at the hearing to raise their concerns to lawmakers. Jacob Yuryev is a recent high school graduate from the Sequoia Union High School District. He agreed that research shows that having phones in the classroom is a distraction, but he argued that taking away phones outside of class on school grounds won't solve the issue of social media addictions. He said that checking their phone would still be the first thing a student does after school, creating a generation of students who can only control their social media use with imposed limits. Students won't have these artificial limits and artificial boundaries imposing on them to not use their phones. It's really important for students to learn themselves through interacting with their peers and through existing in a social environment where they have a choice to make their own decisions. It's important for them to learn how to manage themselves and how to control their own desires. Republican Assembly member Josh Hoover of Folsom helped author Assembly Bill 3216, which would require school districts to develop, adopt, and update policy to limit or prohibit phone use at schools. In response to student concerns, he said recent amendments to the bill ensure districts don't have the right to search a student's phone. He also stressed they don't want teachers on the front lines of enforcing phone restrictions and said schools need to establish a culture where students want to follow policies. Hoover said AB 3216 would build on the existing California legislation that encourages the limiting of smartphones to require policies be passed, which he says maintains a fair amount of local control. That also gives us an opportunity to develop best practices right across the state, really figure out in the districts what works best. Some districts will go for different approaches than others. In 2020, Assembly Bill 272 passed, allowing districts to restrict student cell phone use in schools. Since then, some schools have introduced policies like requiring students to put their phones in pouches and setting up virtual boundaries so students can't access prohibited sites. SB 1283 and AB 3216 have both passed through their first chamber and are headed to the second for approval. I'm Emily Burris, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the incursion into Russia's Kursk region was the first part of Kyiv's victory plan, which he intends to present to President Biden next month. At a press conference in Ukraine's capital today, Zelensky said he plans on attending the United Nations General Assembly next month, where he would meet President Biden. He added that the plan's success largely depends on U.S. support. He said the plan would also be presented to both Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump. Ukraine's surprise military incursion this month left Russia struggling to shore up its own territory. Kyiv seems to have multiple goals with the assault, from boosting morale after a torrid few months 
to stretching Russia's limited resources. The captain of a super yacht that sank during a storm off Sicily last week, killing seven people, has decided not to respond to prosecutors' questions. This is according to his lawyers. James Cutfield, a New Zealand national, is under investigation for possible manslaughter and culpable shipwreck charges. Cutfield was among 15 survivors of the August 19th sinking that killed British tech magnate Mike Lynch, his daughter Hannah, and five others. Giles Gibson has more. James Cutfield has been officially placed under investigation by local prosecutors in Sicily as part of their manslaughter and shipwreck probe. Local media reports say officials are considering doing the same thing with other members of the surviving crew. Under Italian law, placing somebody under investigation does not necessarily mean they'll be subsequently charged. The surviving passengers of the superyacht, which went down last week after being hit by a freak storm, have now left Sicily. Japan has lodged a complaint against China after saying earlier this week that a Chinese reconnaissance plane violated its airspace for the first time ever. Charles Iledesma reports. Japan Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshimashi Hayashi says a Chinese Y-9 reconnaissance plane briefly entered Japan's southwestern airspace on Monday, forcing its military to scramble fighter jets. Hayashi tells the media, the violation of our country's airspace is not only a serious violation of our country's sovereignty, but also a threat to our security, and we consider it totally unacceptable. He adds that it's the first time the Japanese Self-Defense Force has detected a Chinese military aircraft in its airspace, and that Tokyo will continue watching China Chinese military activity and do its utmost to respond to possible anti-space violations. I'm Charles Diladesma. A a senior U.S. admiral said the military may be open to escorting Philippine ships in the South China Sea. Donna Warder filed this report. August 25th, in the contested waters of Sabina Shoal in the South China Sea, a Chinese vessel repeatedly rammed a Philippine boat. Philippine Defense Secretary Gilberto Teodoro. China, although without saying it, and I'll say I'll say it for you, is the biggest disruptor of international peace in the ASEAN region. Teodoro was at the annual International Military Law and Operations Conference today in the Philippine capital, Manila. Also at the conference, head of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Samuel Paparo, who says he's open to the U.S. providing help to Philippine ships. Escort of one vessel to the other is an entirely reasonable option within our mutual defense treaty. The Philippine Defense Secretary says diplomats and defense officials should take stronger steps against China because international statements of concern are not enough. I'm Donna Water. An Oregon-based organization is using federal grant money for land rehabilitation and for training tribal youth to be good stewards of the land. Eric Tegatov reports. The Interior Department's Indian Youth Service Corps has awarded the Loma Katsi Restoration Project $300,000. The funds will support the organization's Tribal Youth Ecological Stewardship Training and Employment Program. Head of the project, Marco Bay, says the Indian Youth Service Corps supports tribal young people age 18 to 30, and up to 35 if they are veterans. What it's focused on is providing paid-to-train opportunities for tribal members to work on their ancestral lands or neighboring ancestral lands engaged in ecosystem restoration or ecoculture restoration work. The Lomakatsi Restoration Project has been around since 1995 and is based in Ashland. Bay says the focus is on ecosystem resilience and reducing large wildfires that have become more prevalent and destructive in recent decades. The organization works in Oregon and Northern California. The goal of the Indian Youth Service Corps grant is for the organization to train 12 tribal youth from seven tribal communities on restoration in Southern Oregon. The group's tribal partnerships director, Belinda Brown, says the program will prepare the young people for careers in forestry work. The success is the youth having family wage jobs, of them being able to contribute and help their family, of them being able to be successful in their community, which elevates them to the mentors for that next generation. 
Bay says the goal is also to include tribes in restoration and management work. This gives an opportunity to get the lands treated in an ecological way and to get cultural fire ultimately back on the ground, incorporating indigenous traditional ecological knowledge with Western science into the work. I'm Eric Tegedoff reporting. Among bills that advance today in the California legislature are a measure that could expand protections for pregnant women who are incarcerated, ban legacy admissions at private colleges, and set new requirements for colleges to address gender discrimination on campuses. The California legislature, which is dominated by Democrats, is voting on hundreds of bills during its final week of session. Their deadline to pass them on to Governor Newsom's desk is Saturday. The governor then has until September 30th to sign the bills, veto them, or let them become law without his signature. In recent years, Governor Newsom has often cited the state's budget troubles when rejecting legislation that he said he would otherwise support. Census data shows that roughly one in four Native Americans are not registered to vote. But in recent years, three states in the Mountain West region have passed laws to allow tribes to register automat- register citizens automatically. Caleb Riedel reports. Native Americans often have to travel long distances to register to vote. Many don't have access to postal service, making it hard to register through the mail. And the lack of internet makes it difficult to do it online. Allison Neswood is Navajo and a staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund. All of that is rooted in you know, the historic treatment of Native American communities. And so it's, I think, our collective responsibility to make sure that our communities can overcome these barriers and have a say in you know, the leadership that impacts our communities every day. Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico now give tribes the option to use automatic voter registration. Michigan does as well. That could mean eligible citizens are automatically registered when they enroll in a tribe. So far, no tribe is doing this yet, but many are working with the states on the implementation details. For National Native News, I'm Caleb Radel. A recent report shows school absenteeism in America is a lingering holdover from the pandemic era, and it's getting worse. Jennifer King reports. Millions of kids are missing weeks of school as attendance tanks across the U.S., Chronic school absenteeism has jumped since schools reopened. More than a quarter of students missed 10 percent of the 2021-2022 school year. That's compared to 15 percent before COVID-19. Absences were more prevalent among Latino, Black, and low-income students. That's according to data compiled by Stanford University in partnership with the Associated Press. Financial roadblocks like housing instability and transportation issues are partly to blame. While people who studied the problem since before the COVID era say something feels different, parents describe children who were aware of their learning setbacks struggling to feel welcome and connect with other kids or trusted adults at school. From a few states that have shared data from 2023, like Massachusetts and Connecticut, absenteeism remains double the pre-COVID rate. In all, 6.5 million additional students are estimated to have missed a lot of instruction during a crucial time for schools working to recover from pandemic learning loss. Jennifer King, Washington. Immigration attorneys say families are in legal limbo after a federal judge in Texas last night paused a Biden administration program that would provide immigrant spouses of U.S. citizens a pathway to citizenship. Lisa Dwyer has more. A federal judge in Texas has issued a temporary pause on the Biden administration's new protections that would allow immigrant spouses of U.S. citizens a path to citizenship. The order by U.S. District Judge J. Campbell Barker comes after 16 states, led by Republican attorneys general, challenged the program in a lawsuit filed last week, arguing that the Biden administration was trying to bypass Congress. President Joe Biden launched the program in June. The policy offers spouses of U.S. citizens without legal status who meet certain criteria, a path to citizenship by applying for a green card and staying in the U.S. while waiting for approval. Traditionally, the process could include a years-long wait outside of the U.S., causing what advocates equate to as family separation. I'm Lisa Dwyer. The State University of New York Morrisville, or SUNY Morrisville, recently wrapped up its first classes as part of New York's Offshore Training Wind Institute. Edwin J. Vieira has more. 
The state-funded program is part of efforts to build up the clean energy workforce. Along with training courses for wind technicians, the program offers hands-on lab and real-world experience for students. Dr. Benjamin Ballard is a renewable energy professor at SUNY's Morrisville and says the goal of the Offshore Wind Training Institute is building capacity. So building capacity means developing training specifically for wind technicians, but also developing a pipeline of students coming from you know K-12 through institutions. And so the training that we proposed in our offering starts with career exploration at the K-12 through level, offering some micro-credentials. He says these micro-credential courses provide a good introduction to renewables. Other courses include electrical theory for renewable energy systems, tower climbing, safety, and how wind systems work. Ballard says the school is pursuing workforce development funding to make this a more economically available long-term program. This can help students afford the school's tuition and transportation costs. While Morrisville's program is still relatively new, student feedback has been positive. Malcolm Ivers is a former Morrisville student currently working as a wind technician at RWE. He notes the most helpful thing he learned are industry standards and practices. Some advice he has for students is to have a versatile skill set. Take elective courses, take unnecessary courses, just to see what's out there and to build your resume. Being able to put EPA 608 certification on your resume might not feel valuable, but it's all about making yourself a well-rounded candidate. Ivers notes the high job prospects drew him to the field. New York State's clean energy jobs have grown more than 8% between 2020 and 2022, a trend expected to continue as the state continues its clean energy transition. Wind energy jobs specifically have grown 52% from 2016 to 2022. Edwin J. Vieira reporting. As the economy continues to struggle with inflation and ongoing fears of a potential recession, a new report has found that the nation's labor market will add more good jobs in the next decade. Nadia Ramlagan has more. Skilled trades will offer solid career pathways and are even more promising due to massive public and corporate investment in infrastructure, says report co-author Artem Goulesh at the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. He adds that most good jobs will require bachelor's degrees or specialized credentials. 66% of good jobs will go to workers with bachelor's degree or higher and 15% will go to workers with a uh, high school diploma or less. A good job is defined as paying at least $43,000 a year and a median annual salary of $74,000 for workers aged 25 to 44. West Virginia is among five states with the greatest expected share of jobs for workers with a high school diploma or less, according to data from the center. The mass exit of baby boomers from the workforce and artificial intelligence in the coming decade will cause shifts in many sectors of the economy. Goulish says blue-collar jobs such as construction and healthcare and maintenance and repair will increasingly require post-secondary training. Those jobs are increasingly going to shift into middle skills workers with more specialized skills. The report also points to job quality beyond salary in the future jobs landscape, including access to health care plans and retirement benefits. The data show 89 percent of workers in the highest wage bracket have access to health care plans and retirement benefits, compared with only 30 percent of workers in the lowest bracket. Flexible work schedules and access to wellness programs are more common in higher income jobs. Nadia Ramlagan reporting. A new study shows the number of fast food jobs are on the rise in California since the state's minimum wage was bumped up, appearing to buck predictions of job loss from minimum wage increase opponents. More from Suzanne Potter. New data show that fast food jobs have been on the upswing in the four months since the minimum wage in that sector went from $16 to $20 an hour. The Bureau of Labor Statistics found that California added 11,000 new fast food jobs from April to July and showed increases year over year each month since January. UC Berkeley professor Michael Reich says the data contradicts doomsday predictions from opponents of raising the minimum wage. The knock is that a minimum wage increase would lead to businesses closing, workers getting laid off, and much higher prices. That's been the knock on every minimum wage increase since 1938. Indeed, a large number of studies have found that minimum wages do not reduce employment in fast food. Wright notes that while fast food work is expanding, its growth has slowed because overall economic growth has slowed, not because of the higher minimum wage. He says the effect of higher fast food workers' wages on the overall economy is too small to detect. 
Reich says higher wages have certainly benefited workers' bottom line, which leads to more spending in the local economy. But they have also led to slightly higher restaurant prices. Fast food prices may have gone up 1 or 2 percent compared to how much they increased in other states that did not raise their minimum wage. That's not enough to reduce consumer spending, so the minimum wage essentially leads to an income transfer from the people who eat in those restaurants to the people who work in those restaurants. Some individual fast food managers worried they'd lose business if they increased their prices to offset higher labor costs. But Reich says the cost increases affect all fast food restaurants, so individual businesses would not lose market share. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. The largest dam removal project in U.S. history is nearing completion along the California-Oregon border. It will allow salmon to have free passage along the more than 400 miles of the Klamath River and its tributaries for the first time in more than a century. Crews will use excavators this week to move rocks diverting water directly upstream of two Klamath dams that have been almost completely removed. The process at Iron Gate in Copco No. 1 will allow water to flow freely in its historic channel, giving salmon a passageway to key swaths of habitat just in time for the fall Chinook spawning season. The U.S. Department of Justice says Kentucky is likely violating federal law for failing to provide community-based services to adults in in Louisville with serious mental illness. The report released today says the state, quote, relies unnecessarily on segregated psychiatric hospitals to serve adults with serious mental illness. The DOJ says it would work with the state to remedy the report's findings, but if a resolution cannot be reached, The government said it could sue Kentucky to ensure compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. The report said that more than 1,000 people had multiple admissions to psychiatric hospitals in a year. New Hampshire health authorities say a person infected with mosquito-borne eastern equine encephalitis virus has died. Julie Walker reports. The New Hampshire Health Department reports a Hampstead resident who tested positive for the mosquito-borne eastern equine encephalitis virus has died. The first in the state in a decade, infectious disease specialist Dr. Richard Ellison says it's rare for people to contract what is also known as triple E. Though it's a very rare infection, we have no treatment for it uh, to do this. And if once someone gets it, it's just, just all we can do is provide supportive care and it can kill people. The CDC says there are typically about 11 human cases of eastern equine encephalitis in the U.S. per year. I'm Julie Walker. A SpaceX capsule carrying four commercial astronauts hoping to conduct a pioneering spacewalk won't be launching at least until tomorrow morning. The Polaris Dawn mission is an ambitious five-day journey to the upper reaches of Earth's orbit. It had been slated to lift off today before a detected helium leak forced a delay. That's according to a SpaceX post on X on Monday night. When the cruise does launch aboard a SpaceX Dragon, it will be the second trip to space for billionaire entrepreneur Jared Isaacman, who founded the mission along with Elon Musk's company. Isaacman previously went into orbit orbit in 2021 on Inspiration4, the mission that became the first ever private orbital space flight. A 26-year-old man has been accused of igniting a destructive California wildfire in early July by throwing a fire rook from a car window during hot, dry, and windy weather. The Butte County District Attorney's Office said that Spencer Grant Anderson of Oroville was charged yesterday after weeks of continuous surveillance by investigators. The Thompson Fire scorched nearly six square miles and destroyed 13 homes and damaged others in the Orville area of the northern Sacramento Valley. The prosecutor's office said in a statement that Anderson was jailed on a no-bail hold after appealing in court to face charge appearing in court to face charges including arson of inhabited structure, arson of forest land, and arson causing multiple structures to burn. The office said Anderson will return to court Wednesday to set further dates to enter a plea and for pretrial hearings. Clear tonight in the Bay Area, lows tonight in the 50s, mostly sunny tomorrow, highs in the 70s and 80s. In the central San Joaquin Valley, clear tonight, lows in the 70s, sunny tomorrow with an excessive heat warning, highs around 100. That's it for the news. I'm Max Pringle with Scott.
to elect delegates to the local station board, we are using single transferable voting, aka choice voting, which provides for proportional representation. Your ballot will include a list of listener candidates. To cast your vote, rank the candidates you wish to elect in order of preference. One for your favorite, two for your second choice, so on and so forth. Only rank candidates whom you wish to seat on the board. If your vote doesn't count towards your first choice, it gets transferred to your second choice, so on and so forth. Visit elections.pacifica.org for more information. Email the election supervisor, nes at pacifica.org, or call 707-500-1910 for assistance. You're tuned in to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley. 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. <laughs> 